And let's get going with uh, John Stuart Mill. And let me just one more time to say John Stuart Mill is formidably influential, uh, very influential on our days. And he is the ultimate of liberalism. And um, in some ways, uh, uh, among all the authors we will be reading this semester, he is the most consistent, uh, the clearest one and the most consistent of them all. Uh, he draws the line to the logical conclusions, uh, no matter what it is, right? Um, and, you know, taking his point of departure from Adam Smith, Locke, Adam Smith, and then uh, um, Bentham, uh, he pushes the line of utilitarianism uh, to its most logical conclusions and is extremely influential, what we call now neoclassical economics. And this, he was exactly the person who made uh, many people who were liberals and democrats in the 1960s and 70s to change and create what they called neoconservatism or neoliberalism and went over to the Republican Party. It was an important dividing line. Um, um, Mill's uh, uh, staunch insistence on individual liberty, right? And, he, and what follows from this staunch insistence uh, for uh, uh, the role of the state, right? And how far states can interfere uh, with individuals. Uh, that was really, I think, the dividing line in which many people who were on the political left, center left, or occasionally far left, uh, by the late 1960s, early 70s, seeing stuff like the affirmative action, the war on poverty, they changed the lines. They said, look, the Democratic Party liberalism really betrays liberalism. That's not liberalism. Read John Stuart Mill. That's when you will, when, when you, you will know what real liberalism is. Right? Anyway, so I think this is, this is why he, you know, his message is very much alive. And I'm sure that uh, 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 this classroom is divided by people. You know, some people subscribe to uh, John uh, Stuart Mill's uh, liberalism. Others probably do think that he emphasizes too much individual liberties. And there is much more of a role to implement the general good by the government. Okay, I mean, I think we left it right here um, last week. These are the main theme of utilitarian, his book on utilitarianism, the way how he departs from Bentham. Um, very important change uh, uh, that he uh, beginning to emphasize that our higher happinesses we can, uh, we can seek. It is not simply quantity, but quality. Uh, of happiness is what we seek. Very important contribution. I think an, uh, this is an idea which is uh, only touched upon by Adam Smith, but really not properly developed and certainly completely missing in Bentham. Uh, it is really mere contribution, which is very important for uh, contemporary uh, economic theory, neo neoclassical economics. They call this preferences, right? That we have preferences. And therefore, individuals will attach different values to different utilities, right? Um, and this really comes from the work uh, of John Stuart Mill. Then, you know, he makes this distinction between uh, legality and uh, justice. Uh, and uh, 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 what is legal is not necessarily just. And what is just is necessarily approved by laws. Um, and then justice and expediency. What is expedient is not necessarily just, um, uh, and uh, well, just may have its cost and may not be the fastest way to get there, right? Okay, so uh, let's labor our way through of this and leave time uh, to look at the questions. Well, the idea is that we are human beings and therefore we have a capacity to have uh, uh, higher appetites than the animal appetites, right? Um, so we have imagination of what animals don't have. We have moral sentiments, and these moral sentiments may lead us in our choices, uh, right? Now, you, you can see 
we, we, I mentioned that about Adam Smith, that Adam Smith might have had this theory of sympathetic humans, uh, which in a way pointed this direction. This is very central uh, for John, John Stuart Mill. Uh, and therefore, he emphasizes that there is a qualitative difference, right, uh, between human and simply animal appetites. Uh, so therefore, you simply cannot do what Bentham did, simply add up, uh, right, uh, um, appetites and to say if more appetites are satisfied, better of the society is. Uh, the chief good, so he argues, is virtue. Be virtuous. And then you will feel good, you will be happier if you are virtuous as such. Uh, but, you know, these are all qualifications of uh, the kind of elementary utilitarianism. I think qualifications, but by the way, uh, most rational choice theorists and most uh, neoclassical economists will also agree with. Uh, those who are critiques of neoliberals and utilitarianism, very often kind of caricature their position, not really understanding that following John Stuart Mill, they do understand that there is a qualitative difference between utilities. But otherwise, he remains by the utilitarian principle. We are rational actors, we are self-interested, we know what our needs are, and we can make good judgments, right? Whether the price we have to pay in order to satisfy our needs is worse for us, right? That is the fundamental, right, idea of utilitarianism, uh, which is, uh, thank you, very healthy today. There are many people who disagree with it. There are many people who agree with it, right? Um, but this is all uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, um, uh, addition. And now a bit on higher happiness. Well, the pleasure of the beast might be felt as degrading by a human being, uh, uh, right? We want to have some, we have higher needs than just uh, um, uh, the animal needs. Uh, so well, you go to a five-star restaurant, they will serve you a little food, right? It will be delicious, but it will be unlike, you know, these Italian family restaurant down the road, uh, uh, um, right in Worcester Street, where they give you right uh, food what you can hardly eat, right? It satisfies your animal appetites, right? So anyway, we have higher needs, higher appetites, right? We want to see our food served in a special way, right? Um, we are not, just don't feed our. Uh, belly as such. And there are, you know, uh, the pleasures of the intellect and imagination. I think we all already have seen this in Russo, how important imagination is. Um, and if you um, are in comparative literature on English, you know, of course, the aesthetic theories of, uh, um, of Schiller, uh, the German poet, right, uh, who emphasized how important actually um, uh, uh, imagination and play is in fi figuring out what, what beauty is, what artists do is something like pay. All right. Um, and then a bit on quality of pleasures, right? The, really the question is what kind of pleasure satisfies us rather than just the quantity. Um, uh, and uh, I think this is, uh, this is uh, very powerful point, uh, well, uh, few humans uh, uh, would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals, um, right? Uh, uh, no intelligent being would consent to be a fool, even though they should be persuaded that a fool is better satisfied than a lot uh, of men, right? It's easier to satisfy occasionally a fool. And this is really beautiful. It's better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, right? Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. Bingo, right? He got it. I think that's very beautifully done, powerfully done. Think about it. Very hard to disagree with this, right? You want to be, right? Socrates, right, and dissatisfied rather than just being satisfied by your needs. Well, I don't want to dwell 
too much on the issue of justice and legality. It's quite obvious, right, that there are differences between justice and uh, legal legality. Well, it, it is unjust if anybody is uh, deprived from his personal liberty or, or property. Uh, um, um, uh, even if, if that's what the law tells you. I mean, communist government confiscated property from people and they did it legally, but uh, uh, John Stuart Mill will say they did it unjustly, right? It was legally done, but unjustly, right? Uh, it was against the, the sense of justice of people of being deprived from their property. And there are laws uh, which do not exist, uh, though they should exist, right? Uh, because some of the individual rights are not properly defended and you really should have uh, such laws. And of course for him, uh, 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 there has not been in his time sufficient laws to protect the rights of women or the rights of slaves. Uh, uh, well, also today we are concerned about whether we have proper protection in this country for individual liberties. Uh, against uh, uh, surveillance techniques, for instance, which were used, right? Uh, very recently in the United States, many people sh think we need very stricter controls on the government, whether they can listen to our telephone conversations, right? We want to have very clear laws, right, which define exactly what torture is. We may be uncertain whether the laws are sufficiently clear, right? So therefore you need occasionally laws which protects uh, uh, human rights. This argument can be used actually for affirmative action, right? But you may need occasionally laws which kind of uh, eliminates the inequalities, right, of people's freedoms. See, some people are less free than others because they have a, start from a different starting point. Then you can use John Stuart Mill argument and to say you need a law which will protect these people and make sure that they are free enough, right? That they are, they, they, you create an equality of freedom. Uh, that would be his argument. And there are laws which exist, but they should not exist. There are bad and unjust laws. Uh, uh, well, we debate this uh, uh, issue a great deal. Uh, uh, I'm sure there are some people in this country who do think that the government should not kill, right? There are some people who are against the death penalty. Probably the majority is for death penalty, but there is probably a minority in this room. I don't want to ask you to show hands, though I might. <laughs> but I'm sure there are some people who think the government should, should not kill people. I'm one of those. I, I, I don't think that's right. I think life is sacred. I believe sufficiently um, uh, uh, in Hobbes, <laughs> uh, first law of nature. Um, no government should kill. Uh, so that's penalty. I, I, I don't think it's right. But you can argue it's, it's necessary to defend other people's freedom, right? Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, John Stuart Mill probably would have been unhappy with the death penalty. Uh, so. Uh, um, uh, we, you may want to change legislation, right? You may want to have a legislation, right, which eliminates the death penalty. Or, you know, another issue is, let's say, uh, again, I'm sure this uh, 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 audience here is divided on the question of uh, uh, abortion. There are some people who believe that, you know, abortion should be prohibited by law because you should defend the freedom and right of existence of the unborn child. Right? There are others who argue the freedom argument on the other side. Right? They say, no, you should not prohibit abortion because you should defend the liberty of the women who carries uh, uh, the child. Right? Well, this, uh, these are just examples right? that these issues are talking to very contemporary issues. All right, uh, um, justice and the e uh, equality. Well, this is a very interesting uh, uh, idea what he's playing around. He said, we have actually a sense that uh, justice is somehow related to equality, that we, we occasionally feel that some degree of inequality is already unjust. 
even if it is legally achieved, by legal means, we may see it is unjust. Usually inequalities are um, um, uh, explained and justified by expediency, right? You have to create these high levels of inequality because you have to create incentives. We just heard this debate, you know, the last couple of weeks. Um, if you try to limit the bonuses, the guys on Wall Street you get, you do a lot of damage because these hot, uh, you know, brokers will be hired by the competition. Therefore, they have to get these hundred million dollar bonuses. Otherwise, the business will be hurt, right? And there were banks which were paying back billions of dollars to the federal government. So the federal government cannot intervene, right? And cannot overrule, right? How much bonuses they pay, right? Expediency, right? They say, oh, give me a break about this justice stuff, that this is unfair that somebody earns a hundred mil a a million dollars. They should earn, because otherwise the competition gets them, right? Well, this is the argument of expediency, not the argument of justice, right? Uh, all right, uh, well, there are different components of justice. Well, the first and most important one, uh, it is unjust to deprive anyone of its personal liberty and property. That's the most important point, right, in John Stuart Mill. He's staunchly defending individual liberty. The second one, <coughs> a legal right uh, is deprived, may be rights which ought not to have belonged to him, right? There may be privileges. I mean, in contemporary societies, this is much less common. In his time, there were a lot of laws, right, which de defended, uh, defended people's privileges, feudal privileges, but he wanted to get rid of, right? Um, they were unjust. Well, he also then suggests that each person should obtain what he or she deserves, right? Even if it is not guaranteed by law. Well, how far you go with this argument, it's again, can be very controversial. Uh, you can say, well, you need a welfare state, right? Uh, you have to provide the basic goods and services for everybody. Uh, you know, this argument can be used, you know? You have to provide housing. You should not let anybody without shelter. Um, uh, or uh, you should not let anybody without health care. Uh, that would be consistent with John Stuart Mill. And then he said, well, uh, it is unjust if you uh, break faith, right? You promise somebody, I will do it, and then you take your word back. That's unjust, uh, that you should not do that. Um, uh, and finally, this is very important, right? Justice uh, cannot be partial, right? Uh, it has to be blind, right? And has to be um, uh, equal to all parties. And now, uh, justice and expediency. I again don't want to labor on this. This is obvious, right? That what is expedient is not necessarily just. Expedient is if you reach that goal with you know, minimum effort, but occasionally you don't, you, you, you better not make shortcuts. Making those shortcuts may be unjust, right? And unfair. And then, of course, sympathy, right? Uh, we are all capable to sympathize uh, and not only uh, with people we know, but with the whole humankind. We have sympathy, um, uh, sympathy for our country and our mankind. It's a bit, you know, like uh, Rousseau's uh, l'amour proper uh, idea. Um, uh, I think I probably skipped this one. Uh, uh, I think uh, we, uh, it's quite obvious, you know, why uh, justice and expediency do have a, a complicated uh, 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 relationship. And now on the other book on liberty, right? Well, uh, why Bentham only emphasized uh, that we are seeking pleasure, Mill emphasized self-development, right? Uh, he said uh, we have to, in our lifetime, we have to develop our capacities, right? Um, uh, and what follows from this, individualism and liberty, uh, these are the major values, right? Rather than just satisfying our needs. 
Well, this is an extremely important idea and very much an idea of John Stuart Mill. We should not take freedom as, uh, as granted. And he said, be very careful of rulers, right, who identify with the people. It does not guarantee freedom, right, because it can lead to the tyranny of the majority. You have to defend the rights of the individuals, the rights of the minorities, um, that they should be also free to choose. This follows very logically from his argument, right, of these higher happinesses, preferences, arrived at by individual judgments, right? Not superimposed by government, but individuals decide what is their higher value they attach to a utility. Uh, and therefore, you know, it can be minorities which do have different preferences, and we have to respect those references. That's very crucially important ideas. And yeah, individual liberty should always take precedence over short-term utilitarian consideration. Right? The main value is individual liberty. And believe me, this is not a contradiction. It follows very logically from the idea of preferences and from the idea that there are qualitative differences between utilities. And you are the only one who can decide what is worse for you. Nobody else can make a, a decision and judgment for you. This is consistent with Adam Smith, by the way. And then freedom of expression. There is nobody whom we will read who stands so strongly for freedom of expression, complete unlimited freedom of expression. Um, and the United States comes very close right, to this, and this is the only country in the world which comes so close to it. In other countries which are democratic, free, and liberal, uh, uh, freedom of speech may be limited. You know? Hate speech may, may be actually limited, right? Denying the Holocaust, and you end up in jail in Germany, right? Um, but uh, in the U.S., we, we are very close to the million idea. And he said, this is absolutely necessary to have the total freedom of speech. Because an opinion uh, which is suppressed is right, then we lose the opportunity to exchange truth for error. So therefore, it's obvious that it's non-controversial, right? That truth, uh, even if it is unpleasant, should be allowed to be spoken, right? Uh, what is more pro problematic uh, should be allowed to people to speak falsehood. I mean, we know, right, that the Holocaust existed, right? Should we allow uh, those crazy people to tell us against all this strong evidence what we have that there was no Holocaust? He argues, yes, we should. Because this is the only way how we can find out the error if we talk about this. It's a very controversial argument, as I said. There are not many countries in this world which do subscribe to it, right? Um, so, and he said, we have to listen to both sides. That's the only way how we find out what truth is. And tyranny by the majority. Well, this is very, very important argument, right? Uh, uh, namely, uh, one of the main major evils of a mass democratic society is uh, a tyranny of the majority. There will be a very strong uh, tendency to um, suppress dissent and to create conformity with the majority views. And he said, well, uh, um, uh, we have to try to resist it, and we have to emphasize individuality. Uh, conformism is moral repression, right? There's a lot of pressure on you to conform uh, with the major, uh, you know, the mainstream as such. And he said, this is one of the big evils what we have to re resist. Uh, we have to defend the individual liberties, right? And we have to... Uh, uh, fight against intervention, legal or non-legal intervention, right? He did not live in a mass communication society, but he would have been outraged, you know, how the media 
tries to brainwash people and right and put into a conformist behavior on people right uh, he wanted to defend people's individual choices of life size and sexual preferences and whatever you name you know it has to be defended uh, and this is very important, right? This is uh, uh, a clear extension, very clearly argued. Adam Smith uh, did, uh, did basically agree with this, but he did not put it so strongly and so clearly. Therefore, intervention by a government is only permissible if injury has been taken place, and right? Place. Uh, the government cannot limit individual liberties only if that causes injury. And he said, look, believe me, I'm not indifferent. I am for compassion. All that I am asking you is tolerance. Respect other people's choices, right? Do feel compassion, but don't try to make decisions for others. Don't impose your will on others. Uh, that's, I think, the... And conformity, right? He is really dislike conformity. It's a century ahead of his time. This becomes a very big issue in the 1960s and 70s, that conformism is an evil, and he already writes about this uh, um, in the uh, mid-19th uh, century. And, well, interference can be only have, uh, be, uh, the only justification is self-protection, right? Uh, 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 this is very much in line of, of Hobbes' argument. Uh, um, and therefore he said, right, I'm not for indifference, but I am for permissiveness, for tolerance as such. Um, uh, well, we should help each other, uh, but that's different than to impose our will or our taste or our preferences on other people, right? Uh, uh, neither one person nor any number of persons is warranted in saying to other human creatures of ripe years, that's different with children, um, that he shall not do with his life for his own benefit, but he chooses to do it. Right? A very strong argument and very troubling. You know, it's, uh, what do you think about drug use, right? Uh, well, if uh, John Stuart Mill err, he errs on the libertarian side. He probably would be arguing for the decriminalization of most of the drugs um, uh, on this ground. You know, this people's choice, if they know that they heard their life, this is their story. Now, uh, very briefly, on um, his views on, on women. And I don't have to introduce you to the background. You know that in mid-19th century, uh, women did not have equal rights, even not in England, not in the United States. They not only did not have the right to vote, uh, but they actually uh, did not have the right to own property uh, as such. Um, uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, Harriet Taylor, um, uh, his lover and wife, uh, was a radical feminist as far as we know, an extremely smart woman. Uh, he, she was more radical than Smith because she actually, as I pointed out, um, uh, opposed even uh, the institution of marriage. So what are the major themes uh, in this book? The first point is um, marriage uh, is uh, the only remaining case of slavery. Uh, well, it's not true, of course, slavery has ex existed elsewhere, and unfortunately, de facto still exists around the world. But he said, you know, uh, the subject, subjugation of women is a case of slavery, uh, and it cannot be explained by the nature of women. And he makes a case for it. Um, he uh, argues for legal equality in mar marriage, and equality of women in politics and education, and finally makes a case for marital friendship. So, um, he said marriage is the only remaining example of slavery. Uh, because they cannot own property, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, their husbands can use them for sexual desires. Uh, so in this sense, it is even worse than slavery. At least the slaves are not expected, right, to love their slave owners. Uh, the wives are expected to love their husbands. So he said this is even worse than slavery, right? Uh, and here he 
kind of elaborates on this issue, right? Uh, that is uh, uh, not simply the obedience, what man wants, but also their, their love. And uh, usually, you know, uh, uh, these uh, relationships were in the 19th century, and in many cases, even in the 21st century, uh, asymmetrical, right? Uh, Men probably does not feel as much obliged to express love towards their wives than they expect their wives to express love toward the men. Right? Unfortunately, I think there are still men like this. Okay, uh, so that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, very provocative, very important statements written in the mid 19th century. Well, yeah, and then he said this cannot be explained by the nature of women. Uh, uh, he expects the counter argument, well, different, you know, the Rousseauian argument. Women are different. They want to knit, you know, they want to be subjugated. He said, no, there are two counter arguments. One is that we don't know what the nature of women are, right? Because they did not have a chance for self-development, right? And then he said, in order to justify women, step remation, you should be able to show that no women were ever capable to occupy certain positions of political authority. If there were women who did that, then it cannot come from the nature of women, right? That's a uh, neat argument. Uh, well, if here is the citation, you know. Um, how would we know, right, what the nature of the women is, uh, right? Uh, um, uh, therefore, this is an invalid argument. Uh, he argues for the equal equality for marriage, and that's today it's a kind of commonsensical. It uh, doesn't need any further um, elaboration. And equality of women in politics and education and jobs. This is still uh, very important. Larry Summer, uh, the president of Harvard, probably has not read his John Stuart Mill carefully enough when he said, right, that women are just not good enough, right, to do engineering, right? He should have read John Stuart Mill and he should have known that there is nothing in the nature of women why they would not do as well in engineering as men would. Uh, sort of, uh, and, you know, we know we still need some attention to diversity, women's diversity, in order to make sure that women to end up in political and other jobs. And then he makes a case for marital friendship. He said, well, I still believe in marriage because marriage can be based um, on equality of partners. So this is John Stuart Mill. I hope uh, uh, you enjoy him. I think he is uh, a controversial person, uh, pushes his point as far as, as it can, but I think he's a very smart, smart person. Uh, um, so let me just, uh, uh, I have uh, 12 more minutes uh, to go and uh, look at uh, the questions and make a few comments how I would try to um, uh, myself deal with uh, uh, these uh, uh, questions in answering if I were in your shoes. Uh, okay, and here we go. Uh, let me see how far I can go. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, question number one. Uh, the first point what I would try to make here is there are people who read Hobbes uh, as believing that humans are evil by nature. This is not unreasonable. After all, why on earth you need a Leviathan unless there is something wrong with us? Uh, one can also say, well, uh, Locke puts a lot of emphasis how rational we are in the state of nature. And Rousseau is explicit about his noble savage idea, right? It is society which corrupts. Uh, we all come out perfect from the hands of the creator and then society screws us. So there seemed to be really an argument here, um, uh, well, would I try to state it quickly, that there is a controversy. Well, I may try to qualify it in a sentence or two, that of course Hobbes could be read in a more complex way, uh, because um, um, uh, after all, Hobbes also believes that we are making rational decisions. 
um, when we are sort of adju adjudicating between our desires and our fears, and we come to a rational decision about this. Um, uh, therefore, it's not that obvious that this is evil, but I would say this is a qualification. That is, still one can see a controversy. Well, Rousseau, yes, he states that we are, um, uh, 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 you know, come out perfect from the hands of God, but after all, in the state of nature, we are savages, right? Um, and therefore, we need some general will, right, to overrule our judgment. So there is some qualification how much faith uh, Jean-Jacques had in us, right? He had a bit suspicious of us. So there, these are the kind of footnotes, you know, qualifications to the argument. But then I would love, if I, what I would do, I would say, well, uh, I am a bit tormented what to think about. Because I do know that indeed uh, people can be quite evil, right? And therefore we do need law and order, right? We do need some intervention. On the other hand, I think I am probably more inclined, uh, I have to err, to err on the side of uh, Rousseau or John Stuart Mill, to believe that people are, after all, ethical, um, and uh, uh, we'll act uh, out of goodwill, and therefore I would like to see less of central planners telling me what I should be doing and what my needs are, and I would better live in a society where individuals can decide and make their, make their free choices. That would be my line. But you could argue the other way around, right? Tell us what your view is. Anyway, that's the way how I view we do deal with this question. Well, that's, I think, quite clear. Uh, Hobbes be believed in a strong and clearly identifiable sovereign, easy to support it with text. I think this is uncontroversial. And it's also quite clear that Locke wanted to limit uh, uh, right, the power of the executive. That's why he wants to separate the executive right, uh, from the legislative. So I, I did that, and comparing them is, is now pretty controversial. You don't have to have many qualifications to this, right? That's quite straightforward. Now, and what do you think, right? Uh, what is your view on this? Uh, uh, and you may say, well, uh, Hobbes has got a lot to say. Think about uh, uh, September 11, 9-11, right? Well, we need a strong government, right? We need security, right? And we just cannot push too far for equality. Or you can take the opposite argument. He said, well, I think all that happened after 9-11 was wrong. We should not have limited you know, individual liberties. That's the American way that you stand by liberty. Anyway, I'm sure people are divided on this. And I would like to hear your views on this. That's a hard question to answer. Uh, in fact, it is also a question, who is a methodological individualist? and uh, collectivist. I would say a methodological collectivist argues that there is stuff which is more than the sum total of individual. Montesquieu's emphasis on law is a very good one, right? That the law, you cannot explain the law by looking at, at each individual and end it up, and that's the law. The law is there, and then it enters the individuals, right? So there is a collective conscience which precedes the individual and enters the individuals. And others like Hobbes or Locke argues the other way. No, we have to start with the individual. The only thing that we can observe, right, is the individual action and desires and will, and then we can arrive at the collectivity, right? Well, I'm not so sure whether you are a methodological individualist or not, but you can actually make a case whether you really think uh, whether the right way is to think about the individual's action and the individual's rather about the collective good, right, uh, which comes from something somewhere else more historically. Uh, uh, Rousseau's general will make a strong case for it. Easy to make, right? There is obviously something that is necessary for a general will. Uh, you want to believe, for instance, uh, um, in uh, uh, universal uh, health care, 
and to say, well, it's, this should not be let to individuals to decide whether they take out their house insurance or not. Everybody be, should be insured, right? It's easy to see, right? Let's not fool us around, right? We need an, a, a general will. So I, I think an argument can be made. Uh, but then you can use uh, 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 Locke or Montesquieu or Mill or whomever to say, well, there is trouble with this argument. Where on earth the general will is coming from? Uh, like, you know, methodological individualists usually that say, what about methodological collectivists? Where do you know what it is, right? Where does it come from if it is not in any individual consciousness, right? So where, you know, how, how do government know what is my need? Did they get a letter telling them what my needs are and overrule my decision that I think this is my need and my preference, right? So that can be devastating. And you can say, well, this opens up the door to totalitarianism, right? That's why, you know, Karl Marx loved Jean-Jacques Rousseau so much. That's why Lenin loved Jean-Jacques Rousseau so much, because they wanted to have the central planners which tell you this is your need. You don't, you know, only your, your short-term needs. I know your long-term needs, and therefore you have to do what I tell you, you to do, right? And Rousseau does that, right? He said, you have to be forced to be free, right? I can't let you to just to be free. I have to tell you what your real freedom is, what your real needs are, and you can be critical about this. So, you see, you can make the point in both directions. And I think both are respectable positions. Well, uh, Adam Smith, pursue self-interest, you achieve the common good. Many of you believe in this, right? Uh, let's have free, unregulated markets, and there it will be end up with the collective good. Uh, but, you know, Rousseau believes in the general will, which is more than the sum total of individuals. Well, you can contrast it. It's very similar to the previous question, right? Uh, and you can make a case, you know, why you think uh, Adam Smith is right. Uh, you know, where, where on earth you will fi figure out what needs are unless people decide for themselves. Or you can say, well, Adam Smith is not living in the real world. Because he assumes, right, a perfect uh, self-regulating markets and perfect informations, and none of those exist. So in the real world, Adam Smith does not, does not apply. And in the real world, uh, actually, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau makes much more sense. Well, again, you call how you make your decision about this. Uh, well, strong government by Hobbes, and Smith uh, is... Uh, uh, about invisible hand, as little government as possible. Again, I don't think I have to elaborate on this. You can see the line of argument. Easy to show that Hobbes indeed stood for strong government. You have the uh, citation, Adam Smith, for the invisible hand. You can add the footnote. There is a controversy about this. But most people today in the 21st century interpret Adam Smith as the person of invisible hand and small government. And then you can say, what is your view? And again, I think this class must be well, split 50-50%. Some people still believe, you know, Ronald Reagan, the government is not the solution, the government is the problem. Other people believe in, you know, uh, liberal Democrats and you say, no, 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 we need big government and just see what happened now in the global financial crisis when there was not enough government and was too much deregulation. We need regulation and just see what uh, George W. Bush did, right? He bailed out from taxpayers' money. Anyway, you see the point, right? What you can do. You can argue it both ways. Well, the gender issue, uh, uh, well, hard to defend Rousseau, right? Uh, he really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he read him carefully. I gave you the citations. He said, well, uh, he foreshadows the idea of distinction between sex and gender. He's a, one can say he's a sophisticated feminist. He said women should not look like men. They have equally humans. They have same human rights, but it would be wrong for women to dress like men, right? Uh, what's wrong about a woman being feminine? There are some contemporary feminists who argue this way. So don't dismiss him too easy. 
Well, Mill, I don't think, needs too much defense for, for, for feminists, though I could offer some criticism, feminist criticism of him. Well, Mill was a utilitarian. Uh, uh, well, what is his difference between Adam Smith's uh, well, this is a hard question to ask. That is not that much difference. But as I was trying to point out in the lecture today, there is a difference, right? Uh, John Stuart Mill is much more conscious about preferences and the qualitative differences we attach to different utilities. The idea is not something what Adam Smith would oppose to, but certainly an idea which has not been as elaborately developed in Adam Smith than it was in John Stuart Mill. Uh, well, this is very easy, right? Uh, again, Hobbes arguing for security and Mill or Locke arguing for freedom. Uh, you can make the case, we have done it in earlier uh, uh, questions. Uh, um, and you can tell, tell us what do you think. Again, I think the room will be split. Do you want to allow people to carry guns? Some people think yes, for individual liberty. Other will say, this is crazy. Most countries in the world wouldn't allow it. And just see these nuts, right? Keep mass murdering people in schools. Of course they do if they can carry guns. 9-11, uh, right? Torture, uh, listening to people's telephone conversations. Some people will say, well, we are living in a dangerous world. We should allow the CIA to do that, right? Others will say, no, no, no. Individual liberty are sacrosanct, right? And this is what I would like to hear from you. Okay. Have fun and please do enjoy it, right? It's not regurgitating these exercises about thinking.